Hello and welcome to the 17th in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of speciation, the study of how individual species arise from common ancestors through a range of evolutionary processes. In particular, in this presentation I'll be looking at a number of claims made in the presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means that I won't be covering the whole topic, and I won't even be covering it in any sensible order. I'll just cover the topics that Hovind himself mentions. So let's get started. Speciation is a fairly vague term. It's probably best to make sure that a creationist defines it rigorously first, which is usually enough to get them squirming. As soon as they give a definition, then you can show why evolution of speciation is not a problem. For example, the standard definition is that a species is a group of animals from which any healthy male-female pair can provide a fertile offspring should they mate. By far the most common creationist complaint in the area of speciation is that it simply cannot be demonstrated. Creationists claim that it's impossible for a totally new kind of creature to evolve from another, that it simply can't happen. All the evidence for evolution and speciation happening today, they just claim, is microevolution. That is, change in the frequencies of certain alleles within the population, but no actual new species. Remember, alleles are the different values that a certain gene can take. So what the creationists are saying here is that they agree that allele frequency can actually change. For example, the well-documented story of moths in industrial England, where they all gradually became darker in order to blend in with the soot-covered buildings. As the air was cleaned up in the 20th century, the moths went back to lighter colours that they'd once assumed, because the buildings were now not as dirty, and hence they needed to change colour to blend in. Of course, nobody is saying here that individuals changed colour, or that the moths had any sort of choice in this. It's just the usual shorthand for moths which blended in with the background better were less likely to get eaten by predators, and hence they survived more and had more offspring that were like them. Creationists quite rightly point out that this is not evidence of speciation. It's just evidence for dark-coloured moths, for which there was already some precedent, becoming more prevalent. All that has changed here is that many more moths became dark-coloured, i.e. a gene controlling pigmentation became more frequent, and another one became less so. There is no new information here, and no new species. It's just like, say, what probably happened to the evolutionary relatives of Caucasians after leaving Africa tens of thousands of years ago. Because the sunlight in the northern latitudes was less powerful, those ancestors with slightly lighter coloured skin were able to absorb more of it, and hence were less likely to suffer from low levels of vitamin D. Hence, paler skin became more common as we migrated north. But that doesn't mean that Caucasians are a separate species, merely that they have a few different genes for controlling skin pigmentation. However, speciation happens very slowly, on evolutionary timescales of tens or hundreds of thousands of years, sometimes millions of years, at least for animals like us who have lifetimes measured in years or decades. So we certainly wouldn't expect to see it happening before our eyes in, say, tigers or elephants. However, we might expect to see examples of speciation having happened in recent years. An example is the celebrated case of the Galapagos finches that Darwin spotted, which had beaks adapted for feeding from different sources and also examples such as the cichlid fish in Lake Victoria, which span a range of species and habitats, all thought to have evolved from a common ancestor in the reasonably recent evolutionary past. However, there's more. Speciation happens on a timescale of many thousands of years in large animals because it requires a large number of generations, probably many tens of thousands of generations, to take place. However, for some organisms, the generation time is very much shorter. Bacteria, for example, where the generation time might be an hour or two, in which case I can watch several thousand generations in one year, and over the course of a human lifetime we can observe tens of thousands of generations evolve before our eyes. Several studies have done just this, including several investigating the evolution of pathogens, such as the hepatitis C virus, within a single host organism. Hepatitis C, once it infects this host, basically never leaves. It just keeps mutating in an effort to stay one step ahead of the immune system. So we can observe speciation within this virus, and many others, as you can see listed on this slide. More interestingly, work done by Richard Lenski and collaborators has studied the bacterium E. coli. With a generation time of roughly three and a half hours, they've been able to study this bacterium over more than 40,000 generations, and have noted important speciation events, including evolution of totally new abilities. More about this later. Speciation can also be seen in plants very easily and has happened many times over the last century in a highly documented manner. For example, in wheat. One good example is the oft-discussed increase in the so-called ploidy of plants, that is the number of copies of each chromosome within the plant's DNA. 
One specific example is that of salsify, a plant that has been observed to speciate in North America during the 20th century. In fact, this happened at roughly the same time and place that William Jennings Bryan was prosecuting a science teacher for claiming that evolution might be true. Let's move on and look at one of these cases as an example, that of the moths I mentioned earlier. I wanted to say a bit more about microevolution, that is, if you remember, changes in the frequency of alleles in a population, such as the example of the pethbird moths in industrial England that I mentioned on the previous slide. In fact, Hoven mentions this example in another straw man argument. He claims that scientists put forward this example of peppered moths as an example of speciation, and hence that this is the best that we can do somehow. Of course, this isn't the case. We're putting this forward as an example of natural selection. In fact, bizarrely, Hovind even tries to claim that the peppered moth story never even happened. I think it's safe to say that pretty much all creationists, except for the most utterly deluded ones, accept not only that natural selection works, but also that microevolution occurs. In fact, they pretty much rely on microevolution, even the young earthers. In fact, especially the young earthers, who need a mechanism for the generation of a vast range of species on Earth, probably at least 10 million at current reckoning, from the very few creatures on the Ark, from the story of Noah in which they believe. Though they don't seem to see the obvious problem here. They claim that the Ark had only a pair of each kind of animal, a term that they never define, and that since then those archetypes spread out and diversified into the creatures on Earth today. But there are, as I said, probably at least 10 million species on Earth, so at some point since their hypothesised flood, there must have been speciation events, or else we would still have the number of species that were present on the Ark, which even they claim is probably not this 10 million, but actually rather fewer. Anyway, the point here is that microevolution is utterly undeniable. There is no logical reason how anyone can deny it. In order for microevolution to occur, you just need four things. Firstly, certain physical traits are genetic. Secondly, genetic information is passed on through reproduction. Thirdly, certain physical traits can affect an individual's survival chances. And finally, environmental changes can occur which alter the fitness landscape. And by this last point, I mean that environmental changes happen that alter the traits required for optimal survival. Like the example of the peppered moths and the way in which buildings became much more sooty during the Industrial Revolution and hence darker. This gave a preferential advantage in natural selection terms to those moths that were themselves darker and hence blended in with the background and therefore weren't quite so visible to the predators. This last point is actually largely irrelevant to the biology, but I think it's fair to say that the environment is always changing, even if merely because of the nature of predator-prey dynamics. But there are of course many other features that change. The viruses in the human body face a constantly changing immune system response that they have to deal with, for example. Other than that, I think that the denial of the first three points is utterly impossible. Anyone who tries to do that is clearly in need of help from a psychiatrist, not a geneticist. And once you accept those points, those first three points, then the fact of microevolution is utterly impossible to deny. The only issue is whether evolution can create macroevolution and speciation. Most creationists accept the fact of microevolution, but a very tiny minority don't. And I would ignore those ones, to be honest. There's nothing more you can do to help them. There are two main ways that large creatures undergo speciation. Whichever way this happens, it involves producing genetically isolated populations, where there is no crossover of genetic material between the populations in order to keep them aligned. Then the random walk of mutations does most of the rest. The first method for achieving this is allopatric speciation, also known as geographic speciation. This occurs when a population becomes divided, for example by a river or a mountain range, or even the drifting apart of two land masses. In this case, the two now separate populations evolve independently, and as time goes on the genetic difference between the two populations becomes greater. When a few neutral mutations occur within each group, they are not distributed with the other group. A few mutations at a time pose no problem, individuals within a group can still mate, but when the number increases, Although individuals within each group can still mate, the difference between the two separate groups is now too large to allow this. Analogously, imagine two groups playing a ball game, throwing a ball to each other in a circle. These two groups move apart, still able to throw to those in their own group, and initially able to throw a ball to the other group, but eventually, as the groups move further and further apart, they become unable to throw to the other group at all, although it's still just as easy to throw a ball to those within their own group. This is very similar to the concept of speciation on a genetic level, where two groups who initially start off with very similar genomes and therefore can interbreed, as they become more and more separate, 
eventually get to the point where they can't interbreed between the two groups but can still breed within their own group quite successfully. At this point they've essentially become two separate species. The second method for achieving speciation is sympatric speciation. This is when a population of individuals is divided by some niche competition in the area in which they live as opposed to a geographical separation. For example, a population of mice, say, splits when two different fur colourings arise and females are only attracted to individuals that look the same as themselves. In this case, the individuals cease mating with those in the other group, so there is no genetic exchange. The genetic mechanisms underlying this, of course, are identical to those in allopatric speciation. There are lots of arguments online about evolution somehow breaking some vaguely defined law of information conservation. I mentioned this one a few presentations ago when I spoke about thermodynamics in the presentation on physics. This is basically the old increase in entropy argument rehashed in slightly different terminology. The argument is that there is some deep fundamental law of the universe stating that information cannot increase in an isolated system. Nobody knows where this law is stated, but it's probably a corruption of the second law of thermodynamics. And, as with the previous versions of this idea, the evolution of species on Earth is not a closed system. In fact, one can trivially see how information is increased during evolution by examining the process of genetic mutation, insertion and replication. So let's say we start with a simple string, say just the letter A, representing adenine in the genetic code. We can mutate that one letter to a C, a G or a T, representing the other components of our genetic code. And that represents new information, in a sense. However, there are other genetic operations that could easily create more information in the creationist sense, say a replication error that causes a sequence to be repeated. These occur regularly in genetic transcription and are well documented. This might turn A into AA, for example. Then a genetic mutation could turn the second A into a G, so now you have AG. There may be another replication, so we have AG, AG. Then we could insert a C into the middle of that, so we have A, G, C, A, G, etc. Remember that all living creatures are constructed from their genetic codes. You can get to any genetic code you can imagine from starting with a single A and just performing mutations, insertions and deletions and replications. So I genuinely have no idea what the creationist's problem is here. I think that the creationists' ideas about conservation of information fundamentally come back to a combination of the second law of thermodynamics and the complexity theory of Medawar. As with the entropy argument, they've taken something that doesn't really apply to evolution, they've modified it to make it fit, but sadly they've also removed any validity that the theory had. And then they said that this is a disproof of evolution. Medawar's original law stated something fairly specific regarding Kolmogorov complexity, which is a precisely defined mathematical concept regarding the complexity of an algorithm required to produce a given output. So a simple sequence such as, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is easy to reproduce with very simple bit of computer code, but a much more complex sequence such as the prime numbers requires a much more complex algorithm to work and hence has greater Kolmogorov complexity. Incidentally, the idea of Kolmogorov complexity states that no simple recipe can generate an item more complex than the recipe itself, which has been used by Dawkins, amongst others, as a disproof of God, so the intelligent design creationists are on very thin ground here. The main proponent of this theory is William Dembski, whose 1998 book, The Design Inference, sparked this part of the debate. Unfortunately, Dembski misunderstands complexity theory. Just as they do with the example of kinds, instead of rigorously defining a term, they use a hazy definition where something like species is used by biologists, which is much better defined. In this case, Dembski comes up with a definition of complexity which is somewhere between Kolmogorov complexity and something called Shannon complexity, and hence none of the mathematical results actually applies. Shannon complexity, often known as Shannon entropy due to its links to the thermodynamic entropy, is due to the American mathematician Claude Shannon, whose 1948 work defined the field of information theory. It's related to the amount of knowledge that you have lost when you remove a piece of data. For example, if you see a string hello world with the o, second O removed, so H-E-L-L-O space W blank R-L-D, it's fairly obvious you've lost a letter O from that string, because we know the English language and we know what sort of words might actually occur. But it's pretty obvious what the message was beforehand in this case, so that emission has very low Shannon entropy, i.e. you've not actually lost a great deal of information by removing the O. However, in the string, say, my favourite letter of the alphabet is blank, 
by not knowing the character that's missing, we have 26 possible choices, and we've got no extra information really to help us there. In fact, we've got more choices in this if other alphabets are considered, like, say, Cyrillic or Chinese. So clearly we've lost a lot of information in losing that character, so the Shannon entropy here is high. Anyway, to summarise this section, the point is that so-called information is created all the time by genetic processes. So it's obvious that the theory of conservation of information is not applicable to evolution. Theories of information conservation apply to specific and well-defined mathematical properties like I've shown, and hence they're not applicable here either. Creationists often claim that mutations can only create negative effects, or that the effects are so overwhelmingly negative that the chance of any creature arising with a beneficial mutation is massively lower than one with a harmful mutation. This seems instinctively true, I grant. After all, if you randomly chop pieces off a human being, it's very unlikely that you will improve how they work, unless you happen to have the sheer fortune to chop out a tumour, say, or to remove an inflamed appendix. However, this intuitive picture bears little resemblance to how genetics actually works. Take, for example, bacteria. Earlier, I mentioned the studies of Richard Lensky and colleagues at Michigan State University. They decided to launch a huge study investigating speciation in bacteria. The generation time for the bacterium E. coli is approximately three and a half hours, so one human year equals something like 2,500 generations. This means that, in one year, we can see the same amount of evolution in E. coli that we would expect to see in a human-like species in roughly 40, 50, 60,000 years, something like that. Lenski's team followed over 40,000 generations of E. coli in the lab over nearly two decades of painstaking research. The result? They have been able to witness massive shifts in the genetic traits of the bacteria, including evolving one strain that was able to digest citrate, a novel foodstuff, that the earlier generations were totally incapable of consuming. In other words, a beneficial mutation. In fact, most biologists believe that the majority of mutations are either neutral or harmless. For example, many base pairs can be changed without actually altering the functioning of a particular gene, because several groups of similar codons all code for the same amino acid. Often mutations are able to work without greatly harming the creature in which they're found, because we have two copies of most genes in our bodies, by virtue of having two sets of chromosomes inherited from our mother and father respectively. So if we have two copies of gene A on, say, chromosome 15, then a mutation in one copy, though it is likely to break that copy, may not greatly harm the owner of that gene, because he or she has another backup copy from the other parent which can do the job too. However, if that change results in an improvement of that function, it could well provide a beneficial advantage to that person. So in this way, the harmful impact of negative mutations can be greatly reduced, while the beneficial effects of positive mutations can still show through. Phylogenetic trees are diagrams that show the degree of genetic relatedness that different living creatures share. They aren't, as Hovind claims, based on guesswork, but rather are based on sophisticated clustering algorithms, which compare the similarity between all pairs of individuals in the tree and optimise the layout to minimise the distance between similar individuals. What this means is that the tree that you generate is the statistically best match to the genetic data, and though that's not a proof of this particular layout being correct, it's often a very good indication that you're at least very close to the correct relationships. Also, it's worth pointing out that you can use any property in order to generate a tree diagram such as this. All you need is a measure of similarity of some kind. For example, you could build a tree based on size or diet, though that might not bear much relationship to the actual evolutionary history of any set of species, because these properties are largely unrelated to how closely linked two animals are. However, the difference between the genetic codes of two organisms, thanks to the well-understood property of genetic drift, does give a very accurate idea of evolutionary closeness. Reassuringly, the phylogenetic trees generated using algorithmic methods agree very well, regardless of which genetic measures they use in order to ascertain the similarity measure. They also agree well with those trees created by other sources such as the fossil record and anatomical considerations. That suggests that these trees are actually showing something real. This is one of the most stunning pictures to come out of modern genetics. And it is truly humbling to see our relationship to the rest of the natural world displayed on paper. This is a phylogenetic tree cleverly wrapped into a circle, in which species are linked to those who are most closely related to them. You can see the human species in just one tiny branch at the top of the diagram, at about a quarter to twelve if it were a clock face. 
And of course, these are just a tiny fraction of the 10 million or so species that exist on Earth. The most amazing result of the theory of evolution, which has been endlessly demonstrated by the science of genetics, is that we are all related. Not just to our fellow humans, though that is profound enough, but we are related to all living things. Evolution is the most inclusive, harmonising idea that science has ever produced. It provides a sense of place and a sense of modesty that human beings are so often lacking. The expanse of life is so very much greater than our one single species, and that is a thoroughly enticing thought. As Charles Darwin himself remarked, there is grandeur in this view of life. He would, I'm sure, be excited to learn how right he was. Well, that's all for now. As ever, there's loads more information on my website at frame.net, where you can also find a transcript of this talk and all the following ones and all the previous ones. And you can keep up to date with my blog as well as learning about some of my other work. See you next time when I'll be talking about fish and other aquatic animals and what they can tell us about the process of evolution. Thanks for listening.